Ladies and gentlemen, next up is Philip Cran, and the session title is Databases, the choice is yours. Thanks. Uh, how was lunch? Good? Very good. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm from Vienna, city of fatty foods, classical architecture, and beautiful women. <laughs> or probably not. Sometimes you're just not that lucky. Um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I work at Elastic. Uh, I'm in the infrastructure team, so I'm helping out uh, my colleagues with Jenkins, Docker, Amazon, whatever they need. Uh, and when I'm not at home doing work for the company, I'm out doing conference talks. So now it's conference season. I'm pretty much all over Europe at the moment Yeah, to talk about databases and stuff we do. And back in Vienna, I run two meetups. Uh, one is about databases in general. So relational databases, NoSQL no databases, everything in that direction, and one group about papers. So we read academic papers, and then we discuss them. And this talk is kind of the combination of these two hobbies of mine. So we will talk a bit about the background and the theory behind databases, how we got databases like we are using them today. And then we look at some practical, very common examples what you can do with databases today. So, databases. I guess everybody is using a database. Uh, you'll have lots of options. Uh, so let's dive right into it. Everything kind of started back in the 70s. So 1970, uh, Cott wrote his important paper, A Rational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. Because before that, there were databases, but everybody was kind, kind of doing their own implementation. Um, and each of these implementations was very different. So if you wanted to use a database back then, you would actually select a database and then see how it worked internally. And then you, write, you would write your application code according to the internal workings of that database. Um, which was not very convenient, because most developers don't actually want to care how data is stored on disk and all of that stuff. And Cod thought, well, that is kind of stupid. Let's find some theory, uh, how to model data in general. Everybody uses that theory, and then we can abstract these underlying details away, and nobody needs to care about them. He was at IBM, and he wrote his paper, and this kind of got all the relational databases we are using today started. So the idea was basically you have a relational model and normal form, and then you have this data independence data will be independent from the specific database. We know this is working not entirely, but pretty much. So if you know how Oracle works, you have an idea how Postgres or MySQL or anything else of these works. So this is kind of the general idea. You have your model, and this is pretty much the same everywhere. And this is actually what he did, the relational algebra part. Uh, so the bottom part is select x name from people x, where x died at age is null. So all the people that are still alive, that's pretty easy. That's what we are using today. Cod didn't do that. Um, what Cod actually did is was the part above that. Uh, this is kind of the theory behind it. So you have t, a free variable with an attribute name, and there exists a tuple uh, with the attributes name, name and died at age. And there is, for this tuple, you find an x in the, in the sum of all people. And you have that x has an empty attribute, died at age and the, the t uh, matches the x. This is kind of what Cod did, and luckily we don't need to use that today. But this is kind of the theory lying below all the database services we are using today. And then IBM pu published another paper, SQL, a structured English query language. So this is where the actual name comes from. Um, but they, somebody else had a trademark on SQL, so at some point later on they had to remove a few letters, so you got SQL. But originally, it was called SQL. And again, at IBM, they developed that. And that is how we actually got SQL that we are using today, like the bottom part of the previous image. And there is great documentation on how they discussed all of that. And they had big fights if it should, call, should be called null or all these other attributes. So back in the 70s at IBM, they pretty much formed databases like we are using them today. And there's this funny story where they tell like a guy called them and asked for the internal specifications of the databases they were writing. And they pretty much gave him everything because they said, well, at IBM, you could 
give everything to everybody because nothing got done ever. So they just gave out everything they had, and except the error codes because they were somewhat IBM specific. And the guy who actually asked for that was Larry Ellison. So he kind of got all the ideas from IBM, and that's how Oracle actually started. And he was the only one who get, really got rich with the database. This is, all the others were just engineers doing the hard work, uh, but he was clever and got rich. So this is kind of how stuff developed. And the nice thing about relational databases or relational model is it's declarative. So you, have, you declare what you want. You don't need to care, like, how do, you, do I iterate over all the entries in my database that I want to get. It's just like, you tell the database, give me that, and the internal implementation of the database, so the query optimizer, will make sure you actually get what you need. And this has worked out for a long time very well. And the second part you can see in SQL is that it was originally back then, built for user interaction. So before that, you didn't have any easy interfaces to get your data. Uh, but with SQL, even your secretaries could kind of query the database and actually get data out of it. But um, the secretary wouldn't know about concurrency or integrity, type safety, and all these things. So this is what SQL takes care of for you. So even the secretaries back then, maybe they were smarter than now, I don't know. Um, could query the data to get the data. And what also proved to be very uh, helpful is aggregated reports. They were not there in the very beginning, but soon people discovered, uh, well, these aggregated reports are actually very useful. So they are also now in the SQL standard. Um, if you want to have a seat, there are more free seats over here. So just move over if you want to sit down. Um, yeah, and then there was this trend, like everybody thought, yes, yeah, SQL is so cool, we need to write our own databases. And you, you can see, uh, as Dilbert's boss always displays, it's not always the best choice to, to write stuff yourself. And you can see, I think Moav has the most RAM. It's not really a sensible solution. Uh, with starting from that, you shouldn't start building a database. And like there were many existing databases, and what caught the the writer or the author of the original paper also did was he wrote COD's 12 rules, which actually defined what makes a relational database a relational database. And that paper very strongly formed, like, how do we see relational databases? And they're pretty similar to each other. But like every good IT person, COD started counting at zero. So there are actually 13 rules, because you have zero to 12 rules. And they define uh, what relational databases must do, and that was kind of unifying this idea how databases back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s looked like. So back then you had a wide variety of databases, and then we got kind of a dark age. And the dark age looks something like this. So you have very few big vendors, and nobody uh, cared to develop further databases. It was just like, yeah, the big ones are buying the smaller ones, or the smaller ones are going out of business, and everybody is using them. And we kind of forgot how to actually build databases. And I guess most of you will know Uncle Bob. He has a very nice blog post about beer, which is also very nice. And he compares it uh, to beer pro production in the US. Because he said, back in the 1920s, you had the prohibition in the US. So nobody would brew beer. And the Americans actually forgot how to produce proper beer. That's why they had such shitty beer for a long time. And only like in the last 20 years or so, they started their microbreweries, and only now they're getting proper beer again in the US. And we kind of had the same with databases, that people actually forgot how to build databases, and you had to relearn how to actually build databases again. Um, so the main motivation is, why do we need uh, this whole NoSQL thing? Um, here you can see the dog is your application. And uh, the tortoise is your database. And you can see it's kind of inflexible and it's kind of slow. And the application, the dog, would be much faster on its own. But the old relational database is holding it back. So this is kind of one of the motivations of why we need actually no SQL databases since we've had uh, relational databases for such a long time. Uh, the only problem with that, there is the cap theorem, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, which makes this a hard problem, actually. So you have these three attributes, and you want to have all three of them. But the paper proves that you can have two at most. So 
consistency is you have one, one view of your data at any given time. Even though you have split your data over multiple servers, at one point in time, each of the, those servers will respond with the same answer to a query. Um, which you would expect. This is pretty normal what you would expect from your query. But with a distributed system, this is actually pretty hard. And it's getting even more confusing because in ACID, the transactional attributes, there's also a consistency attribute, but that's a dis different consistency. With ACID, it's consistency means like you're going from one consistent state to the next consistent state. So yeah, don't have any not null constraint violations, re reference violations, you have the right types. So this is what transactions give you. This consistency is a temporal one. So at one point in time, all the data is the same. The second attribute is, uh, as long as nodes are available, they should respond to queries, which is also kind of expected. And the third attribute is partition tolerance. Partition tolerance is, as soon as you have a distributed system, stuff can go wrong. And even though it doesn't every day, expect stuff to go wrong sooner or later. And out of these three attributes, um, you can only pick two. If you build your system badly, you might only get one or zero of these attributes. Um, so it, it's not a given that you get all, th all uh, two, but three is impossible. And kind of the proof of that is, imagine you have three nodes in two different data centers. So in one data center you have two nodes, and in the other one you have one node. And then, due to partition tolerance, your network breaks in the middle. So you have two nodes on the one side and one on the other, and they cannot see each other. And then you need to decide, do I want to be consistent or do I want to be available? Um, consistency would be, okay, network is broken, I cannot reach all the nodes, I'm stopping, because otherwise I would violate that consistency constraint. Um, or you're available, but then you ha don't have consistency on all your nodes. So this is pretty easy to understand. The paper is also pretty simple, it's just like this, the, the pretty much the same description of it. There's no mathematical proof. And if you have kids, or if you want to explain that stuff to your dad or somebody, uh, you can explain it with Robinson Crusoe. So think of Robinson Crusoe, he is on his island, um, he's distributed from the rest of the world, and then a ship comes by and asks him a current question. Uh, Robinson Crusoe is, I think, originally from England, so somebody might, for example, ask, uh, who is the current king in England? And then he needs to decide, do I want to be available and our answer, even though my answer might be outdated, or do I want to be consistent so I don't answer, but I'm consistent because I'm not, not answering. And then there's this thing called eventual consistency. You can think of that like a message in a bottle. He gets every few weeks or months with the current newspaper. So he actually sees who's been the king three weeks ago. So that would be eventual consistency. Even though your eventual consistent databases probably won't take three weeks to update. Uh, and then there are always the people who say like, but my network is so su super stable, we don't have partitions. Um, so the partition tolerance is like, we don't need to care for that. Um, Unfortunately, that is not true. There's this guy, guy called uh, Kyle Kingsbury, Aphir. He's uh, torturing databases professionally, and he's written a very long blog post on all the things that can go wrong in your network. And it's lots of stuff, and he has many anecdotes from, I don't know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and he, he, he says, like, on average, um, Microsoft will lose, I don't know, three racks of servers per week for, I don't know, bad power, bad network, whatever, and Amazon has that many network li links that fail or switches that break or stuff. So, yeah, you might have a pretty good network, but it's not 100% sure. So, at some point, it will probably break, and then you need to make the decision. Do I want to be consistent, or do I want to be uh, available? And not making this, that decision doesn't help, because then you just don't know what happens, and it's just whatever, best effort. And the second thing uh, that kind of drove the NoSQL movement, the first one being the fast and being able to actually distribute uh, your data over multiple nodes, which uh, relational databases are very bad at, is the schema flexibility. So, the like, different levels, starting at level zero, is like you have bytes uh, on the disk. This is not helping you with a database. So, yes, this is just like a file without any meaningful meta information, it's stored, but you cannot really query that. 
Minimalist structured would be you have a key value store. So you have keys, and over these keys, you can actually query the value. Um, this looks very intuitive. Uh, the thing you need to remember with a relational database, everything that you have in your database, you can query. You can put up an index on uh, some columns to make it faster, but even without an index, you can query all the data all the time. With a key value store, that, that, that's not true. You can only query the key and get back the value. Um, you cannot search in the value, and if you at some point discover I don't have the required information in the key, you will need to restructure your data. But this is a key value store. It's very uh, easy or simple. It's very scalable, so it might solve your problems. Then there are the so-called advanced data structures, uh, where you have stuff like graph databases. You have different nodes and edges between them, and you can very easily find, I don't know, the shortest path between two nodes. Or you have the very popular document stores, which are just storing JSON. Since everybody needs to do JSON at the moment, it's all JSON document stores normally. XML is not that fashionable. And then you have column-oriented databases, which look pretty similar to relational databases, but they normally have kind of column families, which group stuff together, and they often don't only have uh, a row and a column, so being kind of two-dimensional, they often add a, th add a third dimension, like adding a timestamped value. So a column uh, and a row cannot have one value, but they can, over time, have multiple values. So this is what column uh, data stores look like. And then uh, the relational databases, which are very strict. Yes, you can have null values, but all the attributes always exist. You cannot leave out anything. Uh, the nice thing is you can do stuff like SQL queries, you can do joins, uh, but you cannot easily distribute those databases. So it's kind of a trade-off, and you will need to find the right solution for you. So NoSQL is not NoSQL, but not only SQL. But some people say um, you have the recruiters who are also always pimping your CV. Uh, so what they're actually doing, if somebody doesn't know SQL, they will simply put up uh, NoSQL uh, in, the, in the CV, maybe. But that's not helping. Uh, and yeah, I love Dilbert. Uh, there is this big data thing, and everybody is interested in doing big data. Uh, because yeah, the book of Wikipedia tells you big data is saving you, and you can make lots of money, and it is in the cloud, it's everywhere. And yes, you will get rich. So how does uh, big data relate to NoSQL? It's kind of difficult because there are two definitions. The, the first one is very broad. Big data is just you have lots of data which you probably cannot store on one computer, so you need to distribute it, uh, and that is big data. And then NoSQL is kind of part of big data. The other one, the other big data definition is kind of stricter. So you have offline data or a data warehouse, and you use stuff like Hadoop or Spark to query that. So these are the two definitions. But I don't really like the term big data too much because it's mainly a buzzword thrown around by business people and it's just like everybody is doing big data anyway, even though nobody needs it, or few people need it. And yeah, don't overuse big data. <laughs> um, bad stuff will happen to you if you do. Okay, and then there is dbengines.com where they have a ranking of how popular databases are. Pretty much like uh, for programming languages like the Tiobe Index and all the others, they rank how popular databases are. And Oracle is still currently at the top spot, but MySQL is catching up. SQL Server is also pretty strong, but already the fourth place is currently taken by MongoDB. And then there's Postgres. And from the NoSQL world, there is also Cassandra is pretty, pretty popular, Redis, and on the 11th spot at the moment, there is Elasticsearch. So the ones we will take a look at uh, in the next 30 minutes or so is PostgreSQL from the relational world, and then we'll uh, cover MongoDB, Cassandra, Redis, and Elasticsearch. So let's jump into the practical part. First off, MongoDB. Um, even though this is not really specific to MongoDB, this is more like anything that stores documents, so JSON underlying it, uh, will have similar capabilities. And for each of these systems, I will just pick out one feature I find kind of interesting or nice. Um, so this is about MongoDB because it's the most popular one, but you can do the exact same thing with CouchDB, Couchbase. Elasticsearch can pretty much do the same and many other systems. So it stores documents uh, in the form of JSON. 
And there's this very popular blog post by Ted Neward, ORM is the Vietnam of computer science. Um, so object relational mapping is probably not the best thing. And he wrote it pretty much 10 years ago. Um, and I don't know, back then there was no JPA, there was, Hibernate was just about to start, stuff was, was much worse than it is today, but there's still some truth to it. Because what he's talking about is the impedance mismatch, so you have two different concepts between the relational world and the object-oriented world. And yeah, object relational mapping is always trying to bridge those two concepts, but it's probably not working too well. But let's dive into that why. So if you're using Hibernate or JPA or something, who has written something like that in the past? OK, quite a few. Do you think this is OK? No, it's not OK? Yeah, if you say, I'm OK, <laughs> you're probably in denial. Or it's like Stockholm Syndrome, where you just give up and, yeah, it's OK. Um, so let's assume a very simple example. So you have an abstract base class and employee, and then you have managers and workers. And the managers can approve funds, and the workers have experience. Managers obviously don't have any meaningful experience. <laughs> or, yeah. I hope we don't have too many managers here, but I assume I'm safe. Um, so you have a very simple base class, and then you have two specific implementations of that. How do you do that with a relational database? Uh, you have basically three options how to map that. The first one is you have a union tables, table, potentially with many null values. So as long as you just have two specific implementations and just one independent attribute each, that's fine. But if you have like five implementations and they have lots of uh, different attributes, uh, you will have more like a Swiss cheese with lots of holes than a relational database because it will be mostly filled uh, with null values. Which works, but it's not really the purpose of a relational database. The other option would be to have two concrete instances. Um, so you would have one table for workers and one for managers. And you could query each one of them and it looks pretty nice unless at some point you find out, actually, I want to query all my employees, and I want to get the employees uh, from my database. And yes, you can write a union query, but again, you can see uh, in the object-oriented world, this is a concept that's very natural, like you have inheritance, and you just have different objects, uh, but you don't need to make any ceremony about querying data or anything. Whereas in the relational world, Object orientation is not that much of a thing, uh, so it's kind of painful and you need to work around problems and limitations with union clauses. And the third option would be you make three tables, one for the abstract base class and two for the concrete instances. Um, of course, you will have lots of tables if you have uh, lots of concrete instances. Um, and as soon as you want to get a full employee, either a manager or a worker, you will need a join. Again, this is working. Um, it might be a little slow, but it's mostly okay. But again, you can see it's just the concepts don't really map that well. Um, so what is the uh, solution? Uh, this is an example uh, from MongoDB. This is using their, they don't call it object relational mapping because they don't have relations. They call it object document mapping, so ODM. And I think documents map to object orientation uh, in a much nicer and cleaner fashion. So you annotate the base class uh, with an entity, employee, and you will throw everything in, it's called a collection, but basically think of it as a table, uh, in the employee, and you have an ID that MongoDB will generate for you, don't care about it, you have the attributes, and in your specific implementations, you don't need to do anything specific. And if you save that, uh, what you will have in your database is something like this. So you have a generated uh, ID, which is not that nice, but it is easy to generate in a distributed fashion. That's why you cannot have like uh, an increment, auto-incrementing value, or not the least, not easily. Uh, then you might store, for example, the class name with that to actually know uh, which entity uh, the, the thing is coming from. And then you just have the attributes you want to store. And it's just all in one collection, and you can very easily like query all the names for, of your employees, or you can very easily get managers uh, or workers. And it's just, it maps pretty cleanly to the object-oriented world. So this is one of the nice use cases for MongoDB. Um, where MongoDB is nice also is if you need simple replication. So if you just want to have multiple nodes, 
think of it a bit like RAID. In RAID, one of the disks is failing, another one, uh, with RAID 1, another disk will take over, and with MongoDB, replication is pretty much the same thing. You will have multiple nodes, and if one of them is active, and if that topples over, another one of them will pick up. The only problem is, as soon as you want to shard your data, so if you, it's getting, the data is too big for one server, and you need to split it up into multiple so-called shards, uh, stuff gets more complicated. Because then you will have, in this example at the bottom, you have three shards, and each of these shards needs to be replicated. And you can only do read and write operations uh, to the, the one active node, so two will be kind of on standby. So of these nine nodes on the bottom, only three can do write operations, and if you enable it and your data might not be consistent anymore, you could read from the other two nodes, or basically the other six nodes at the bottom. So you have lots of basically idle nodes which are just sitting there and not doing much work. So this is kind, kind of wasteful. And on the left-hand side, you have, they're called config servers. And in a production system, again, you should have three of them. And they will actually know where the data lives, on which servers the data lives. And then you have um, the routing servers on the top. They will normally live on your application servers, but still it's like many moving parts. So as soon as MongoDB outgrows one single replicated server, it might get a little more complicated. But there are other options in the NoSQL world which will do that better. But next up, let's jump to Redis. Uh, the Redis is generally a key value store and much more. So you have lists and sets and sorted sets and all different data structures, so it's not just key value stores, but a bit more. And now it has also like geo queries and many other features. It's still not really probably your primary data store, uh, but it is very easy to use and has some interesting features. Redis actually, the name comes from remote dictionary server. That's why it's called Redis. And the use case we look at is statistics. So think about you have logins. So you have lots of users, and they log into your site. And you actually want to know, like, at, for example, at which hour which user logged into your system. And you get basically have two options to do that, to use here. First off, you have bit sets, and the other data structure is hyperlog log. So let's take a look at bit set. Assume you have your users, and they have signed up with your server. Uh, so you will know, okay, this was the first user who has ever signed up to my server. This is the second user, the third user, whatever. So you have the users in a nicely ordered fashion. And whenever a user logs in for the time frame for which you want to record that, you will simply flip a bit. So you have, at first, you initialize a, a bit set or with zeros, and as soon as the first user of the system logs in during that hour, you will flip the first bit in that long list of zeros and ones. And for every user, you know which position they're at, so you can simply flip their bits. So for a million users, you can do with uh, about 120 kilobytes or so, which is not actually that much. So if you have logged that for every hour of the day, um, you will use, I don't know, three megabytes or something like that. So that, that should be totally doable. And then you can very exactly tell who logged into your site when. And then you can sell that to your ad service or whatever, and you have all the details you need. The other data structure is hyperlog log. Um, it can count unique elements. So each of your users is unique. Probably you have a unique attribute like the email address. Uh, and it uses very little space. So it will only use 12 kilobytes in total for whatever time frame you want to calculate. Uh, the only downside is it's a probabilistic data structure, so it doesn't give you exact results, but the error rate is below 1%. Um, it's quite an interesting data structure. We don't have enough time to jump into the implementation details, but it's called hyperloglog, -log, and it's very good for counting unique elements. And Redis has implemented that, so if you want to count just unique stuff with very little space, you can use that easily. Comparison is like hyperloglog -log uses constant size, which is nice. Uh, Bit sets, on the other hand, have the advantage they are exact. Uh, so with hyperlog logs, you cannot be 100% sure if that user actually logged in. Uh, with, but with bit sets, you can. And another thing about bit set is that you can very easily aggregate that. So for example, after one week, you don't care about each of the hours, but you only care about the day. Did a specific user log in during that day? And then you simply connect, uh, do an OR connection of all the bits of one user for that day. 
and you have the aggregated value for that day. And you know the user has logged in during that day or he hasn't, which is nice. And generally, uh, Redis is very simple and is pretty much omnipresent glue, or I would often call it like glue. It's used for caching, um, keeping some state information, just doing little stuff, probably not your da primary data store, but covering lots of different use cases. And it's super simple and fast for that. So next up is Cassandra. Cassandra is already poking fun at Oracle, because you know the Oracle in Delphi, uh, it, they didn't know anything. They, they were, were just, I don't know, inhaling some fumes and then uh, making strange predictions. On the other hand, in Greek mythology, Cassandra, uh, in the Trojan War, uh, was the one who could actually see the future, but nobody believed her. So they are kind of uh, the better version. The Oracle doesn't know anything, and it's just guessing, and they kind of actually can see the future, even though, at least in the beginning, nobody believes them. So this is kind of where the name comes from. So what uh, drives Cassandra is it wants to be scalable and highly available. Um, it uses consistent hashing for that. We'll jump to consistent hashing in a moment. Uh, so if it's uh, highly available, uh, which attribute are we losing? Consistency. That's one of the trade-offs you will need to make. So this is what consistent hashing looks like. Let's jump into each of these things, because it's, this is kind of what actually drives Cassandra. The first thing is you have, for every data set you want to store, you have an ID. You can either auto-generate one or you just use some whatever attribute you have. And this ID is then hashed. Why are you hashing it? To avoid any hotspots. For example, if you would uh, use email addresses, um, people whose email address starts with the letter E would be much more common than people with starting with the email address Z, for example. Um, to avoid any such hotspots, uh, you want to hash your whole key space. So your keys get evenly distributed over your key space. So you can see minimum key, maximum key, and you assumedly have three servers, so you evenly split your key space into three parts. Since you've hashed it, uh, every node will get approximately the same number of data entries. The next thing what you do is you actually rotate that uh, key space clockwise. So you, in the previous slide you've seen ABC, like brown, whatever, orange, green, and you just rotate that clockwise, and everything that falls within the first piece of that ring um, goes to node A, everything uh, going to in the second, uh, third uh, to node B, and everything in the last one to C. So with, assumedly, you're hashing some value X, and the hash value falls into uh, the first part on the A node. A node gets, is the primary store of the data, but the data gets also replicated to the B node. That is why you have this rotation. And th the, then if you hash Y, uh, that would fall into B primarily, and C, the C node would do the replication for you. So it's always like you're in one key space, there you store the data, and then you replicate it to the next node. So if one of the nodes fails, the next one can take over. The next nice thing about that is um, if you want to either add or remove nodes, uh, you only need to change something on the neighbor nodes. So if you, for example, add a D node, as you can see uh, on top left, uh, top right example, uh, is that you're just splitting up the A data into two pieces. So you're just splitting data on the A node, and then some node is stored primarily on the D node, and some stuff is replicated to the A node. So this is just that one node, and B and C nodes don't even care about that split, so you can very easily add new nodes. The same happens uh, if a server fails. Um, if, the C, no, if the B node fails, as in the bottom example, um, it will just work as it has been before, uh, but C, knowing, okay, I have replicated all the data from B, B has failed, now I will serve that data primarily, and in addition, I need to replicate all that data to the A node, so I have two copies again, so it's safe. And this is also why your data is pretty safe with Cassandra. Everything is replicated, and it's very easy to, if you add a node or if a node fails, uh, what happens next? So it's very easy to go one state to the next, and the data is still very safe. And just to make this scaling up and down a bit easier, you normally have something called V nodes, uh, virtual nodes. So you don't just split your key space into three big chunks, but multiple 
smaller ones, and then you distribute them evenly over all the nodes. So if one uh, server fails, you will not just have one huge chunk to migrate, but you have multiple smaller ones, and they are already distributed all over all your servers, so you have less data to migrate around. This is how Cassandra works. Uh, the only downside is, as I said, availability is not um, given. And as your father will probably tell you at some point, um, if you expect consistency, you will fail hard with that. However, you can work around with it uh, if you say read and write quorum. quorum. A quorum will say uh, all the data that I need to write and read needs to be acknowledged by the majority of nodes. So if you have like one primary copy and two replicas, uh, you will need to write at least to two of these nodes. And if you read data, you will also need to read from two of these nodes, and the result must be the same. And if they're not the same, then you will need to go to the third node and actually check like what is the current result. So that, is, that gives you back consistency, but it has a lot of overhead. So many people are not using Quorum for all their queries. Um, but it's, and Cassandra often calls itself tunably consistent, so they don't like the inconsistent term. They just say, yeah, if you tune it like that and you have a very high overhead, we can still give you more or less consistency. Um, but some people say, yeah, uh, all that eventual consistency is too hard, so we went with immediate inaccurate. And yeah, the Cassandra people don't really like me if I say that, but yeah. OK, and then there is Postgres. Uh, the next comic is very small, but I'll just uh, try to narrate it. Uh, so you have a guy who says, uh, well, our relational database is much too slow, and nobody can work with that, and I have now made a plan. You can see the Gantt chart. He has made a huge Gantt chart to migrate everything to NoSQL. Um, and it will take weeks or months, but then everything will be scalable. And then the colleague says, wait, let me check. Have you used the right index? Oh, no, you haven't. I'm setting up the right index for you, and suddenly your queries are 10 or 20 times faster, not percent, but times. Um, and suddenly your relational database is fast enough again. So yeah, for some people, uh, relational databases might be too slow, but many of you probably are not Google, Amazon, or Oracle, or whoever, uh, so yeah, a relational databases might work for you. Um, and one other aspect is relational databases is kind of a misnomer now because it's actually SQL databases and SQL goes beyond the fully relational model and has added additional features. Um, so actually, I maybe we should stop calling them uh, relational databases and rather SQL databases. And SQL is really powerful. Many people don't know the advanced features because they only interact with it through Hibernate or some other very bad abstraction. And then you... <laughs> it is true. <laughs> You don't really know what your database is doing. It's just like, hey, I'm a Java developer. I don't, know, I don't care about my database. I'm just using Hibernate. No idea what is happening be below that. And yeah, that will work in the beginning, but at some point it will fail, or you don't really use the full potential of relational databases. And if you actually use SQL correctly, you can do lots of stuff with it. And that is also why, and why everybody knows SQL, uh, that many of the NoSQL databases, even though they're called NoSQL databases, are now trying to add some dialect of SQL. So you have, for Cassandra, you have Cassandra query language, CQL. Google has something similar to GQL. Couchbase was a little more creative. They called it Nickel, um, but it's still <laughs> Couchbase query language. Uh, RethinkDB has ReQL. So everybody is trying to, to add something similar. And those were doing pretty well they have actually implemented the SQL 92 standard, and they are super proud of it. However, the relational people then will say, like, using SQL 92 is being proud of having something similar to Windows 3.1, because it was also released in 92. And nobody would boast, like, I'm compatible with Windows 3.1. But the NoSQL databases often are, and yeah, I'm not sure if that's really that a great argument. Um, so what, is, what you get with relational databases is you have lots of features, you have a very mature product, they have just been around much longer, um, NoSQL needs to go through a lot of these pain points still, uh, and you also have some NoSQL influence. So Postgres has now JSONB and can also store JSON, even though their query language is super weird. Um, MySQL is kind of doing the same thing, so it's kind of 
Also feature-wise, the NoSQL world is now kind of growing towards uh, the relational world a bit more, like aggregates are coming in more and more systems, so the two worlds are kind of growing closer together. And let's see if there is much of a difference in a few years. Nobody knows. Okay, and finally, uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is actually a full-text search engine. So what is full-text search? Um, it is different to relational databases. Um, with relational databases, they are very much black and white. You have data you store in your database, and you query it, and you get your results back. And if there are no results, you don't get anything back. It's very much black and white. Whereas full text search is much more many shades of gray. You're storing some documents, you're querying them, and then you want something that is closely matching to that. But it doesn't need to be exact. So for example, you don't need or you don't really care about singular and plural and stuff like that. You're just searching for a concept normally, and you want to get results for that concept, much like in Google. You type in whatever query you have, and then you expect some sensible result, even though it might not have the exact same words you're querying for, but it will have, or it should be the concept. So you just want to express what you're looking for, but you don't really know the finer details of that. And that is what full text search is trying to give you. So you have your documents you want to index, and the first step is like, you need to actually know what the words in your documents are. So normally you split them on white spaces, you throw or you split them on stuff like dots and commas and all that stuff. Uh, dashes you normally just remove and combine the words to one. And so you have the words. And after you have the words, um, you actually remove so-called stop words. Stop words are just very little words that add little meaning to the document because they're everywhere. This is like and. D, N, all these little words that are in every document, they add very little information, so you simply throw them out. And the next step is then you do stemming. You actually reduce the word to its word stem. You just care about the concept, but not if it's singular, plural. Or you might not even care if it's a noun or a, an adverb or a, uh, an adjective. So for example, uh, if you have beauty or beautiful, uh, with the default stemmer, they would uh, be reduced to beauty with an I at the end. This is what they were reduced to. And even if you search, your search term, if you search for beautiful, again, that would also be reduced to beauty with an I at the end, and then you would search where is this stemmed word actually occurring in my document body. And you might have something like synonyms, so you know in your domain there are specific synonyms, and you can actually uh, add the synonym matching as well. And then you have a big index uh, in your full text search index, which looks something like this. So you have three documents, and then you throw out the stop words, and you're left with some other words. Um, for example, yeah, best, blue, bright, whatever. And then this is called an inverted index, because you're going from the term to the document. Um, and you can see best is in document two, and blue occurs in document one and three. And if you then would search for, I don't know, search for bright and search, so you search for bright search, it would actually say, okay, bright is in document one and three, and search is in document three. So you probably are looking for document three, because in document three, both of your terms are occurring. And you normally store it again as a bit set, so you just have all your documents you have, and then you simply flip the bit. Does that specific word, which is kind of the row, uh, occur in that document? If yes, flip the bit to yes, otherwise no. And again, these bit sets you can very easily and or or combine and do powerful searches with that. So this is kind of what full text searches do. And actually this the score or the, the searching, as I said, is very much like these gr shades of gray because you always have a score or a quality. So all the documents you will find will have kind of a quality uh, to your search term. And you can sort by that, and we don't go into all the details. Uh, the basic idea, what you care most about is, first off, the term frequency, TF. So if a specific word occurs in a document more often, and you're searching for that term, the document where the term occurs the most times, it's probably very relevant to you. Uh, on the other hand, if you're searching for multiple terms, and you have a term that occurs in many, many, many documents, and one document that occurs just in very few documents, uh, where the word that is occurring few times, that is actually carrying much more meaning, because the other one is 
occurring everywhere anyway. So these are the two main concepts for full text search. But you can do like boosting, so you can say the title is more important than the body or stuff like that. So it is quite complicated. Um, we have the full documentation of the scoring theory, but this is kind of the gist of it, how it's, it's working. So generally, the more often a term is occurring in a document, that document is more relevant. Um, or if a term is generally very occurring very often, in the entire system, it's not as relevant as terms that are not occurring that often. So this is how scoring works. And yeah, this is our stack. It's, it was called Elastic Stack. Now it's just, ah, it was called Elk Stack. Now it's just called Elastic Stack because these are all our products. So you can do full text search and you have Kibana, which is kind of the window into your data, and you can ingest data with Logstash and Beats. So this is how you can actually do all your full text search, log analysis, and anything in. Elasticsearch or the Elastic Stack. So to conclude, um, history of databases. So in the 70s, we didn't have no no uh, we didn't have SQL. So no SQL because we didn't have it. And then in the 80s, it was yes, you should know SQL actually because it's a good thing. And then in the 2000s, people said like no, the the rigid schema is too too strong for me and it's not scalable. So no no SQL for me. And then it was like, not only SQL, because like SQL can be a good thing. And some people say, now it's back again to no. SQL is the actual thing, and that no SQL thing, forget about that. So it's kind of going around, and yeah, we, we'll see where we land. Uh, and then often people are asking like, but is this specific system fast? Um, and this is my favorite comic for it, uh, because Professor Sipkin, Sipkinski uh, is testing if the house cat is more intelligent uh, than the squid under similar conditions. <laughs> and as you can see, <laughs> these tests don't always make that much sense. And previously, there have been benchmarks. I think it was MongoDB, Cassandra, and Couchbase. They, they did benchmarks with, all the, with their two competitors each, and each one of them managed to find one scenario where they were at least twice as fast as their competitors. But each one of them found one scenario where that happened. So whatever benchmarks are out there, uh, forget them. Normally, the only thing you can guarantee is that your benchmarks will be different than my benchmarks. So unfortunately, there's no way around, and you need to benchmark for yourself. And here you can actually check uh, which is the right database for you. This is a little older, so you can still see stuff like FlockDB, which uh, Twitter created, but I think it's not really uh, under active development. And yeah, HP is not sure how popular it is today. But you can actually go through the graph and then see um, where you end. Would be interesting where, where everybody lands. <laughs> OK, so who, who ended at Couchbase? Uh, HBase, so, sorry, HBase? Nobody. OK. FlockDB. No one. Neo4j. One. OK. Um, React. OK, a few. Yeah, React had a rough spot, but they are now kind of back. Uh, couch, which is mainly couch based now. OK, one. MongoDB. OK, relational databases. OK, that, that doesn't look too good. OK. Thanks. Um, I have stickers. Uh, if you want elastic stickers, uh, we, I have like 10 different stickers. Uh, so I'll put them up on the table here. Just come afterwards and grab them. Uh, and we still have one and a half minutes. Are there any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Where's the microphone? Wait, 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 wait. It's coming. I have experimented with uh, Lucene, I think, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, my first impression was, uh, where are my quoted uh, strings? Very often, uh, we want a uh, sequence of uh, words. Is there some approach uh, with uh, the modern uh, um, uh, systems like yours? Actually, you are also based on Lucene, I suppose. Or? Yes, so Elastic Search is based on Lucene, uh, like Solar and nearly everybody else. Uh, so we'll say Lucene is kind of the, 
the engine driving your car, and Elasticsearch is kind of the car around it. Um, so what you want is like a, a phrase. So you have specific words in exactly that same order, right? So you don't want independent words, but like exactly that phrase. Exactly. Yeah, that, that should still be possible, yes. You, you, can, you will just need in your inverted index. Um, going back a few slides. So how you would actually implement it, that is that if you store your term, you actually store the position of that term. Um, so with the documents where you just have, for example, with best, uh, you would not ha just have two, but you would have, for example, two dash, and I don't know where is best, wherever best is, but it would be like after re removing the stop words, it would be, I don't know, the third word or something like that. You could simply store that uh, two dash three. So you would store the position in all the documents uh, for that thing in your index. And then when you actually search, you will only take, or you have the information there that actually you're in the same document and you're like one word after the other. Um, that is how you can find sequences of words. So this is how the inverted index would do that. You're storing the position, not only like the word is occurring in the document, but you're also storing when indexing the position of the word inside your documents. And then you can e easily query that. So that's how you, you would access that. Does it answer the question? Yes. Very good. Um, I'm out of time. Thanks a lot, and I'll grab the stickers.